I've missed more than 900 shots in my career. I've lost 300, I've almost lost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. These words were spoken from one of the greatest basketball players that has ever played the game. Perhaps you've heard of him, Michael Jordan, AKA Air Jordan. Throughout his career, Michael Jordan became an unstoppable force on the basketball court. He had a will to win, and that is evident from the six NBA titles he won. Though he was one of the greats, that didn't exempt him from failure. In fact, that failure pushed him even more to be the very best he could be. As the movie Meet the Robinsons puts it, he just kept moving forward. Now, we can't all be as good as Michael Jordan was on the basketball court. Actually, probably all of us will not be ever as good as he was. But there is a comparison to be made with his motivation and determination and perseverance to our own as Christians. We as Christians have been called to persevere. That begin, the beginning of that call is for salvation. Yet, how does that call to salvation work? Do we have free will in being able to have that call towards God's salvation? Does God intertwine for us and we aren't able to have our own free will? Do election and free will work together? How does that work? I assure you, that debate has been going on for centuries and has yet to be fully solved. It's a mystery. And because of that, and, this, and there's a reference to it in, this, in the passage that we're about to go through, but we're going to put that on the back burner because that is not the exact, exactly the point of what Peter is trying to get across in 2 Peter, as we will be in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-11 through 11 today. Throughout the New Testament, many names and many disciples have been called out by Christ. Few in particular, Peter, John, Matthew, all the 12 disciples you can think of, but one of the most influential Christians in the New Testament that was called by Christ was Paul. Formerly known as Saul, Paul spent most of his life persecuting people that he would become. He was a Jew. He persecuted Christians. And in Acts chapter 8, he witnesses a stoning of Stephen, which, who was a Christian martyr, and he consented to this stoning. In the very next chapter, we see Paul, who ends up going on the road to Damascus, and ends up being blinded by Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and his life changes forever after that. He ends up becoming one of the most influential evangelists and apologists in defending the gospel and evangelizing the gospel out. So Christ had called Paul into this ministry, and that call was something that Paul himself developed throughout his life. Now I understand that most of us will not have that road to Damascus experience. But I assure you that that call that you had as a Christian was a mo one of the most vital parts of your life. And I assume also that you grew in that call, right? I mean, if you didn't, you have a little bit of work to do. Now, there is such a thing as being stagnant, feeling as though there's a time in your life where you do not grow at all. It happens. But if you happen to never grow, should your salvation be questioned? I would argue yes. We will be starting this new series in 2 Peter. Today specifically we will be spending our time in 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 11. So let's first dive into a little background of what's going on. The second letter of Paul, second Peter, second letter of Paul, second letter of Peter was written by Peter as the first verse says Simon Peter is servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Though that is debated, Peter is the author of the leading candidate for authorship. Now when was it written? People, scholars tend to believe that it was written between 63 and 68 AD, around the time of Peter's death and martyrdom. In 2 Peter 1.14, we get this clear indication that Peter is about to go through dying for his faith. So we understand that 67, 63 to 68 AD is about the time it was written. Though we're unsure about who Peter is writing to. There's no specific people that he is writing to. But... 1 Peter was written to the churches in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So we can get a kind of good indication that he is writing to these churches in the time. In the situation, in 1 Peter, we see Paul, or Peter 
writing to these people through persecution. He's trying to comfort these people enduring persecution. In 2 Peter, however, he takes a different approach. Basically, he's confronting false teaching. Mm -hmm. There are these teachers that are coming into these churches and criticizing the gospel. And Peter's saying, no, no, that's not going to happen. That's not going to fly. And so he's wanting to prepare these believers for this. And in the section we're going to discuss today, he's trying to assure them of what that call to Christ means and what it entails. So, essentially, Peter wanted to warn these believers of lies and people who had turned away from the faith. Though we as believers in America are not faced with the same type of persecution as the New Church, we do confront struggle mm. and false teachers. Therefore, we need to know our salvation and how to combat false teaching. Now, many of you have questions concerning your calling and your election. Are you truly saved? Are you truly called by God? How can you be sure of your salvation? Today, I will try and answer some of these questions by helping you understand your call through Christ through three distinct aspects. The first aspect is going to be that Christ has imparted to you all that you need in your call to Him. Secondly, I will show you how, to, how you must grow in your call to be effective in that call. And lastly, I will give you the result of that call which is the impossibility to fail. My purpose is for you to understand your own call to Christ, what has come from that call, and how you can continue to live out that call. So let's go ahead and open up to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-11, through 11, and dig in to what Peter is trying to say. In verse 3 he says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him, who called us by His own glory and goodness. So right here we see the first aspect of your call to Christ. Basically, we have been imparted all we need to fulfill our call to Him. It says in verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and holiness. We know that His, that personal pronoun, is Jesus Christ Himself because it's referenced in verse 2. So Jesus Christ's divine power has given us everything we need for life and holiness. What's the everything? What, what is the everything that Christ has given us. We can tell through the historical background that Peter is speaking towards overcoming the corrupted world. So we are talking about fighting a world of sin. So in a sense, we're talking about sanctification, which is this big fancy word to say being completing a process of becoming whole. We have justification over here. You are saved by faith through grace, which is the point of salvation. And then sanctification, which is continuing the process to be holy, and then we reach glorification at the end of our lives. The cool thing here is that there's a parallel with divine power and Holy Spirit, which is the everything that Peter is talking about here. Think about it for a second. If we're talking about overcoming a world of sin, we're talking about sanctification, what's the thing that Christ has given us to overcome that world? The Holy Spirit. Also, instruction of God's Word, which is the Bible. Both of those two things make up the everything that Peter is talking about. We can also see divine power here as being a parallel to that thing that Christ has given us. Divine power is the same power that was used to raise Christ from the dead. The Holy Spirit has been given us so that we can spiritually rise from the dead and free us from sin. So, in essence, you have the power. And it was given to you by Christ. And it is a B E A U to full thing that he has given you. As we continue in verse 4, it says, Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world. So we understand here that not only has God given you every, the Holy Spirit and the instruction of God's word, but he's also given you his special promises. Back when I was a kid, there were many things that I got to learn and many opportunities that I had a first to learn. For instance, I had a first time to talk. I had a first time to walk. In this particular instance, when I was about four or five, I had a first time of tying my shoes. My parents had taught me how to tie my shoes, and I couldn't grasp the whole bunny through the whole loop thing. I don't know why, but I just never could get it. Until they finally said, hey, if you tie your shoes for the first time, we'll go to Disney World. 
All they had to do was give me the proper motivation. I wore a Mickey Mouse shirt all the time, so this sounded like a great deal to me. Problem, I ended up tying my shoes and we never went to Disneyland. Mm. It's been 20 years. Irony is, is I'm going on my honeymoon in four months and we're going to Disney World and my parents are paying for travel. So I guess you can think that they've partially made that promise true. But the point is, is they didn't fulfill the promise that they gave me 20 years ago. Peter, in this passage, adds to what Christ has given believers in order to be sanctified. His special promises. In this previous verse, we see that Christ's glory and goodness provided our calling as Christians. In the previous verse, we also see that Peter continues to show what Christ gives through his glory and goodness. When glory is used, it refers to something that only belongs to God and God alone. Exodus 15, 11, when the Israelites are in the desert. Deuteronomy 28, 58, same thing. Hebrews 1, 3. This in turn means that when sinners, when sinners see the glory of Christ, they are witnessing his divinity. His excellence or goodness simply means his moral life. So Christ's deity, which is his glory, and his perfect humanity, which is his goodness, has granted believers his special promises. The phrase, has granted, comes from the Greek verb dorumai. This is in the perfect tense and describes past action with continuing effects. So if we are looking at Christ's most valuable and greatest special and precious promises, this should encompass all the promises that play a role in God's saving work. Our spiritual life, resurrection, abundant grace, guidance, strength, and security. Though I love my parents, they're not Christ. And they have not provided those promises, and they have not kept that promise at four. But Christ keeps every single promise he makes. And the promises that he made in the past continue, as we see in the Greek language, those, those promises continue throughout our lives. In verse 4, it also says, These promises were given to you, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So the phrase in verse 4, may become, seems to indicate that this is talking about a future time in which believers will be able to overcome sin. But there's no way this is talking about the future time, right? Because we were given the ability to overcome sin when we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, right? So I think that in Paul's in P Peter's argument, we're not necessarily talking about a future time. We're talking about a time at which you were con at, at conversion where you were given the ability to overcome sin. And we were given the ability to escape the corruption of the world at that point in time. Peter turns around and states that believers are partners in the very life that belongs to God. We are given the ability to escape with the Holy Spirit and the eternal promises from Christ. So as we move on to verse 5, we see that there is other things incorporated in our faith in Christ that need to be had. Which leads us to our second aspect of our call to Christ. We must grow in our faith to be effective in our call. In turn means faith must be incorporated by other important virtues. It says, for this reason. So because of the calling of Christ that he gave you, because of Christ's gift of the Holy Spirit and his promises, he tells you that you are to add to it goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. All of those are in order. But the virtues that Peter uses here resembles an ancient literary style, which are called the Sorites. Through this style, it is unlikely that Peter is expecting Christians to follow these virtues in order. For example, it would be impossible to have goodness before knowledge, seeing as one must have the knowledge of God before goodness can even take root. Understand that knowledge of God comes as a salvation part, but in knowledge of God in sanctification terms, you have that, but in order to get goodness, knowledge of God would have to come first, right? So, taking it in order is not necessary. Though you can if you need to. There are many virtues that we can talk about, but we're not going to dive into them individually. We'll just point out a few. For one, an important virtue here that Peter is discussing, one might think is self-control. What time period are we living in? 
Well, there's a Hellenistic culture in which Peter is confronting, right? And so self-control was a value that the Greeks used as a sign to say intellectual people had this value, this virtue, this was important. To Aristotle, to, Aristotle, to Philo, to other Greco-Roman philosophers, this was an important virtue because what it showed is, is that somebody who was intellectual had the ability to have self-control. It was important. So Peter is relating this value specifically to the Hellenistic culture of the time. We know also that Peter was using every way imaginable to relate to these believers. So we also have virtues like uh, goodness, knowledge, self-control. Knowledge, think about that for a second. We have the Gnostics in the first and second century who believe that the body is evil and that in order to be enlightened you need knowledge. So, could knowledge be an important aspect and virtue that he includes here for that reason alone? Th these virtues are all directly related to ourselves, to our vertical relationships to God, to our horizontal relationships to each other. They include our moral character, our efforts to further our knowledge of God, our self-control in all facets of life, our perseverance in our spiritual lives, our godliness and our reverence for God our brotherly kindness to each other, as well as our love for one another. The believer who has these qualities will be effective, and the believer that does not will be ineffective. This sets up this dichotomy that Peter discusses in the very next verse, in verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed. From his past sins. So you see this dichotomy that Peter sets up. Believers will grow in their knowledge if they work towards these things, and they will not grow, and they will falter if they do not work towards these things. For if these qualities are yours and in increasing, it brings out a bold statement that Peter says. Are yours and in increasing is drawn from two present participles in the Greek language, huperkanta and pleosanta. The first one has a meaning of owning property in an abiding sense, and the second one refers to possessing more than enough. Essentially, if the virtues are abundantly present in a believer's life and actually on the increase, that reality will render this believer neither spiritually useless or unfruitful. Unfruitful in the Greek is archarpos, which also kind of means barren. It's sometimes used in connection with unbelief and apostasy. However, it can also refer to true believers who for a time are unproductive. So the idea here is that if believers do these things, they will know for sure and they are secure in their faith. If they do not, however, they are indistinguishable from true believers. Not growing and continuously faltering in your call can make confidence dwindle in your assurance that you have been cleansed from your former life. This robs Christians of their assurance. While you may be a true believer if you are not growing, you may start seriously questioning whether or not you are. A friend once told me that the opposite of faith is not doubt. It is apathy. Though you may lose assurance if you are not growing, there is a positive spin on this, I think. The positive spin is that if you truly care about your spiritual life, but you are idle in it, you can be assured in the fact that you still desire your faith. If you are apathetic towards your growth, you have a little bit to worry about things. Point being, apathy means you're not going to do it. If you care enough and you're in this state of idleness of not growing, you're still in this state of, I want to grow. It's repentance in a sense. So we understand that caring about your growth will propel you in your sanctification. Which leads us to the third point and the third aspect of your call to Christ. In verses 10 and 11 it states, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the third aspect is, we will not fail if we desire to grow in our call to Christ. At the end of this passage, Peter tells the believers to be diligent to make certain about Christ's calling and choosing them. Be diligent comes from the Greek verb spudaste. In this passage, it is conveying 
urgency, and eagerness. In this sense, the believer is to be urgent and eager to acquire this genuine faith and sanctification. So Christ's calling you is indeed certain and secure. It states that you will never stumble to do these qualities, or never stumble if you do these qualities. Though I think the issue sometimes in our lives is that we stumble to do these qualities, not necessarily that we stumble when we have them already. Each quality is within our grasp as Christians to have and hold, but acquiring them takes our continuing desire to pursue Christ. We are made alive and we are made new, and we do not have to succumb to the nature, evil nature of this world. So, with the knowledge of growing in spiritual maturity, do you have what it takes to persevere in your faith? Christ is enough and has given you everything you need to continue to grow if you lack it or if you desire it. If you lack desire and if you lack commitment, you will fail. In summation today, we went through 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. It was shown that you as believers are called to salvation in Christ. The first point was to show that through this call, Christ has imparted all that you need to fulfill that call. Secondly, everything that Christ has given you is not enough for that call to be assured, but also you must add and grow in that gift that Christ has given you. And last, if you do in fact grow in your call, it will be impossible to fail. Assurance of your salvation in your call is determined by your desire to seek Christ. Your desire to grow in your actual practice of allowing the Spirit to lead you into holiness. What's clear in following Christ is that it is extremely difficult. James 1, 2 pinpoints that we all go through trials. However, James continues in saying that the trials that you go through produce perseverance. It produces character. Some of you today may be doubting God's promises because a prayer may not have been answered right away. Others of you may not necessarily be struggling with what Christ has given but you may, not, you may be struggling in the growth aspect. Maybe you are stagnant and feel as though you can't grow. Perhaps you feel just as deflated in your faith as the Patriots football word was two weeks ago. We'll call it deflate faith gate. Try saying that five times fast. Maybe because of this, you have no assurance of your call to Christ. This happens to many of us, actually. Yet the reality is, is that most of us will struggle with the problem of idleness in our faith at some point. This doesn't necessarily mean that you aren't a Christian. It just may mean you need to start becoming more self-aware of your idleness and start pursuing growing in Christ. Wherever you are in your journey, good or bad, up or down, what needs to be done is you need to understand that Christ has not forgotten you. He's given you His promises. He's given you His grace, His love, and His mercy. He's given you his Holy Spirit to dwell inside of you so that you will be able to fight against the evil nature of this world. Your call is not supposed to be idle. It's supposed to be vital. My purpose today is to help you understand your own call and what has come from that call. How you can grow in that call and what will happen if you do grow. This call is without a doubt one of the most important aspects of your faith and of your life. It delivers you out of bondage. The call assures you a part of the whole of the body of Christ. It makes you whole in Christ and allows you to become exactly who God wanted you to be before the fall, which was perfect. All you have to do is run to Christ and the rest will take care of itself. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love will be added to your faith if your faith is your axiom. Today I encourage you not to lose your passion to live for Christ. He's given you everything you need and you need not worry or tremble at anything that comes your way. For some of you, maybe you have never made that step to fully trust in Christ. If that is you today, then do not run from the only thing that can fill that void. Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago was a real man. He lived a perfect life. He was born of a virgin and he was fully God and fully man no matter how hard that is to comprehend. 
He came to be a substitutionary sacrifice for you. He died that death on the cross, and his blood is the only thing that can save you. After that death on the cross, Joseph of Arimathea buried him in a tomb. And three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that he is, in fact, God, and that he can save you from yourself. If you desire this gift that God has given you, all you have to do is trust in him alone. Understand that he saved you and wants to be the Lord of your life. In order to accept this gift, you must repent from your old life and let him lead your new one. If you have this gift already, don't let it stay stagnant. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 28, Jesus tells the parable of the talents. A man, a master, decides to allow his servants to have a part of his property while he's away. Master gives the first servant five talents. Master gives the second servant two talents. And the third servant he gives one talent of money to. When the master comes back, he's found out that the first servant not only has five of his own talents that it was already given to him, but he's produced five more. The second servant had two extra. And what did the third servant do? With the one talent he was given, he went and buried it and let it stay idle. In the same way, do not be the third servant. Invest your life, invest your time, your energy into your salvation and into your sanctification to Christ. Because when you do that, He will honor you and when you put your faith in Him and also when you grow in Him. Let's pray. All right.